I'm Dr. Brian Sims with NASHBIT, and I'm honored to be your host today. And I'm really looking forward to today's talk because of all the, the strength that SAMHSA has put forward in terms of this 988 movement and the things that the states are embracing, we are honored today to have Dr. John Palmieri, who's gonna be bringing us uh, the keynote presentation a little bit later. So I'm excited about today. We'll get things rocking and rolling. Now, everyone, I want you to take a look at this. This is not a psychological test. Uh, this is actually a picture. And uh, when I first looked at the picture, I could not tell anything at all. And I had to ask, this is actually an artist rendering of the SAMHSA logo. Okay, you take it from there. But it's just one of those things where it's very creative and it's a great kind of starting as a, a preliminary titling for the SAMHSA convening uh, number three. Next slide, please. And here are your numbers again, folks. Wonderful, wonderful numbers. We are starting to see an ever increasing number. We've had uh, at least uh, several more organizations that have joined up. And just a reminder to everyone that if you would like to be a part of this, please don't hesitate to give uh, Karen a connection through email or otherwise, drop it in the chat box. Let us know so that we can add your name to that list. What you also see to the right is that it is still going. Uh, we've reached now 1,080 within the YouTube format alone. Uh, you're looking at that special youth edition as really topping the numbers. Our learning community continues to grow. And it is something that we can say to each other, let's get out there, let's communicate, let's make sure that everyone uh, is on, on board with this. Next slide, please. And if it's disappeared from your calendar, here again is the link uh, that Karen's putting in the box, or Kristen, I'm sorry, is putting into the box uh, so that you can have it connected to your calendars in case it was lost like mine. Uh, you'll be able to have it uh, going forward. Um, you know, I, I do want to mention at this point that as we get into the um, crisis jam for today, I just wanted to give people a reminder that if you would be so kind, uh, keep your systems on mute. We've been hearing some interesting things from people who come off of mute. So just a slight reminder, please, to uh, place it on mute while you're there. And next slide, please. All righty. We are now into the talk.crisisnow.com site under the learning community. And it's very important, folks. Uh, this is a particularly important slide. And one of the reasons why is it has all the information you could ever want to know. If you want to know about uh, what is coming up and what has happened in uh, before, please, this is the site you want to go to. You can go to the chat box right now and you will see connectors for it. Uh, I do want to point out in this that uh, there have been a number of questions raised about the recordings. And we just wanted to let you know that for the most part, most of the time, the the recordings are on board by the same day. But if not, you'll see them by the next day. But you can see that there's a plethora of material here that you can utilize, you can go forward, you can come back. Some have said, well, I haven't been a part of the, the uh, crisis network, uh, so I've missed on a lot of the uh, previous episodes. You can take a look at any of those episodes by going into this particular site. All right, next slide, please. Now, this particular slide is interesting. Uh, it's an article uh, based out of uh, Nevada that is looking at their 988 system and communicating with regards to language and cultural barriers. In particular, in this slide, the um, Asian, um, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander populations, which for Nevada, as I'm sure it is for many other states, uh, they have an ever increasing number of the population of the um, North, you know, the Asian Americans and the Pacific Islanders. And what's interesting is that they are seeing what I'm sure other states are seeing is that the cultural and language competency training that is specific for 988 is really not seen in these particular populations and is much needed. So it is at least raising awareness that this is also another piece of the communities that are marginalized that really need to be taken a look at as far as getting this word of 988 out to. Next slide, please. And this, uh, I have to laugh in, in, in front because 
Uh, many of you watch the Super Bowl or otherwise may have seen this particular ad, uh, but Kristen Chenoweth was in the commercial. And this was sponsored through uh, Oklahoma's 988 hotline. And <laughs> it is just a spectacular uh, commercial, but it is one of the ways, again, that uh, we pointed out in previous slides, there has been an effort to really get the word out about 988. So we found this one to be uh, rather interesting. So what I'd like to do is just show you this commercial uh, and we can go right to it. <laughs> Remember when you put your pants on the fourth grade? Everybody knows you cry yourself to sleep. Wink. <laughs> I think your bald spot's kind of cute. <laughs> oh, that's where it all went. Oh, it's a little hair bunny. <laughs> La wacky wacky. <laughs> Yee-ha! Oh, is that a new wrinkle? <laughs> this guy. Oh, she's never going to love you like she loves that boy. Honey, do you need to speak to someone about the Kristen Chenoweth in the room? Yeah, I do. We all have our burdens. Call or text 988 to get yours off your back. No, 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 no! You know, there are so many ways to get the information out to everyone, and we've uh, highlighted some other ones in the past when you were looking at how to appeal to the kids uh, with the video that we showed, whatever gets you talking. Uh, here's an opportunity again to get the word out that it's okay to speak about it. It's okay to access it, but it's also a big message to get it out there that what we are saying is 988 is there, it's available and it does good. I mean, many of the places have seen this already, but again, it's about getting the word out to as many people as we possibly can. So next slide, please. And we have a quote that you, you have uh, seen before because this is kind of going down the line of what the states are reporting and many are reporting continues to be a problem. And that is about emergency department boarding. And just a highlight to remind us that this is something that needs continued work and that we're trying to look at 988 as a significant piece of reducing these numbers overall. So we'll keep that piece uh, ongoing. Next slide, please. And we have at this point reached our keynote speaker for this morning. And I wanted to introduce to everyone, uh, Dr. John Palmieri. And Dr. Palmieri, well known to all of us and all of you, is the deputy director of 988 and behavioral health Crisis Coordinating Office out of SAMHSA. He has been instrumental in doing everything with regards to this 988 implementation. He's been on top of everything. And SAMHSA has been such in the forefront of making sure that this implementation has been done properly and working with the states. And it is my great honor to present Dr. John Palmieri with today's subject with regards to 988 and the SAMHSA convening number three. Dr. Palmieri, if you will. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, I'm not sure I'm about being on top of everything. It is in some respects feels like uh, trying to keep up with a, with a fast moving train, uh, but we are definitely doing our best in trying to lean in and lead uh, from the federal perspective uh, to the degree that we certainly can. Um, and also a tall order to follow Kristen Chenoweth uh, uh, to speak about 988 and crisis services, uh, but we'll do my best uh, here today. So really happy to be with all of you. I'm going to spend a little bit of the time here providing uh, just some quick updates on some of the operations work that we've been doing. Uh, some of it will look a little bit familiar, uh, but hopefully a couple of new pieces of information to share. And then I wanted to spend a little bit more time in the back half of the presentation talking a little bit more about our recent convenings and conversations regarding the broader crisis system transformation uh, and where we're going from here and what are the conversations that we need to continue to amplify and to elevate in order to be able to truly achieve that vision of a robust crisis continuum that provides linkages to uh, services to support individuals in crisis and to prevent uh, crisis situations from happening in the first place. 
So you can go to the next slide. Uh, so these next couple of slides are really just summary slides of our recent uh, NISDA data. So the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, we've talked, I think, a little bit about this um, with respect to the 2021 release of NISDA data. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these two slides, but what I'm am doing over the next couple of slides is, is I guess, just reinforcing the context um, in which we are working. And everybody is certainly painfully aware that uh, suicides, suicidal ideation, emergency department boarding, which Brian just raised uh, a few minutes ago, these issues are not going away. And for many communities, unfortunately, they're getting worse. Uh, and so it is within that context that we all have to act with urgency um, as we move forward. So this slide here speaks to the NISDA data on adolescents age 12 to 17. Um, and you can see, I mean, the, the, the takeaway here really um, is at the bottom um, that speaks to about 3.4 million youth um, that had either serious thoughts of suicide, made suicide plans, or attempted suicide uh, in the past year. And yes, Amy, it is heartbreaking, I agree completely. Um, and then go to the next slide, which is gonna speak to the same um, piece for adults. Uh, so again, uh, kind of a complex diagram that looks at the various intersections between the thoughts, the planning, and the actual suicide attempts. Um, but the bottom line here from the 2021 NISDA data Again, speaking to nearly 13 million adults aged uh, 18 or over with um, either serious thoughts of suicide, um, have made suicide plans, or attempted suicide uh, in the past year. And go to the next slide, please. And I just, in that same context, I uh, wanted to highlight a couple of papers um, that many of you may be aware of already from the CDC. Um, that have come out fairly recently, uh, speaking to some of the risks and some of the inequities uh, in risk uh, that still exists in this country. So this first one um, that describes recent changes in suicide rates by uh, race, ethnicity, and age group, um, this looks at uh, the period of 2018 to 2021, um, actually after a couple of years in which the overall uh, rates of suicide declined, um, in 2021, it has gone back up nearly to where it was in 2018. Um, and if you drill into this uh, paper a little bit more, you'll see that there are disparities um, in terms of the, the trajectory for suicide rates. So the, while they have gone down uh, for um, the white community, they actually, suicide rates have gone up for American Indian, Alaska Natives, for Blacks, for Latinos. Uh, and so clearly, um, there are issues here in terms of inequity um, and who uh, is continuing to be burdened and increasingly burdened uh, by some of the challenges uh, in access to care. And then for the youth risk behavior survey that recently uh, came out, I think there was some uh, publicity around this as well. I'm uh, not going to go into the details here, but particularly looking at adolescent females um, and uh, issues of feeling uh, hopeless uh, with suicidal thoughts, uh, extremely problematic for adolescent females uh, compared to males. I mean, the, the overall picture is, uh, is grim in general for high school students um, who participated in this survey. Um, but I would say in general for adolescent girls, more prominent um, and for multicultural uh, population, uh, even more uh, dramatic uh, levels of distress uh, compared to other populations. And so again, um, thinking about breaking out, disaggregating some of this data to really understand where some of the disparities exist and where our attention really needs to be focused to lift up um, the importance of reaching um, these populations and providing services that impact these populations in a positive way. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm just going to take a moment here to talk a little bit about the coordinating office. I and mean, we've talked about the 988 office within SAMHSA for a long time, even though it technically hasn't really existed for all that long. Uh, it was only just codified into statute uh, with this uh, omnibus appropriations in 2023. So while we've had kind of a team that's been growing over the past uh, two years almost now, um, the, the actual language around having an office stood up uh, is fairly recent. 
Um, and wanted to reinforce here what we see as the primary kind of charges or mission or goals of our office. And so we've talked a lot about these two overarching goals, one being the, being the lead federal organization or the lead federal structure to oversee and support implementation of the 988 Suicide and Crisis, Life, crisis Lifeline. So that obviously includes um, to a large degree uh, the cooperative agreement with the 988 Lifeline Administrator uh, to be able to support um, states, territories, and tribes in uh, strengthening local 988 response to making sure that we are working with our partners to align communication uh, efforts. And then ultimately, hopefully, we've talked a lot about our hopes here around launching a national communications campaign that ultimately will promote behavior that um, uh, increases help seeking, particularly for populations that we know to be uh, historically excluded or at higher risk of suicide. But then in addition to the whole piece of work uh, of, on the lifeline, we also are very much focused in on this other piece around the broader behavioral health crisis services transformation. So we see our role um, as being very instrumental in setting that long-term vision for crisis services, for making sure that we are the lead federal agency supporting a coordination of activity across the federal government, across HHS, across non-HHS partners, to make sure that we're all kind of in lockstep driving activities forward with respect to that crisis tr transformation, that we are also very much leaning into those partnerships with states, territories, tribes, private sector, nonprofit organizations, provider community, recognizing that those partnerships are going to be critical in order to execute on the many things that are gonna need to happen to support crisis system development. Uh, we do have a significant role in disseminating data improving data collection, disseminating quality standards. What does quality mean in the crisis space? What are services? How do we define services? We have a significant role in helping to clarify those things. And then also making sure that we're using that data to monitor, evaluate performance, communicate the effectiveness of services, making sure that there's broad awareness of what works and what doesn't work and what we don't know uh, so that we can sort of fill those gaps with additional uh, investigation uh, and support to learn more about what works so we can continually drive performance improvement. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, just a couple of quick updates on the operations side. Many of you, I think, already know that um, we have launched through Vibrant, uh, the Lifeline Administrator, through um, uh, a contracted agreement with Trevor, the uh, LGBTQI plus pilot. Uh, to provide specialized service access for uh, youth and young adults. Uh, this launched in September of 2022, uh, both through phone, through a press three option and through text and chat. Uh, the text and chat has not to date been 24 seven, but is moving in that direction. Hopefully will be soon. And you can just see here that we've been able to publish some preliminary data since the launch of the pilot at the end of September in terms of the number of contacts, about 111,000 total that were routed um, through call, chat, and text. It's a significant percentage of the total volume of routed calls, chats, and texts coming into the system. Um, I would say overall, the demand for service has been quite high. In many respects, exceeded what we were expecting uh, in terms of demand for the service. Uh, and then you can see here the answer rates uh, where we're at currently. Um, and this is an area that we're continuing to uh, work on with respect to building uh, system capacity uh, as we are for the system as a whole to improve answer rates, uh, particularly for calls. Next slide, please. And then generally speaking across the network, uh, just uh, a summary of data uh, over the six month period since the transition in July. Uh, and you can see here that uh, again, continuing to connect more people continuing to connect more people more quickly uh, to services through all uh, communication channels. And this is this is still, as I mentioned in that earlier slide, in terms of functions of the office, this is still very much a focus of activity every single day uh, in terms of driving system performance improvement uh, with respect to answer rates, local answer rates, and average speed to answer. Next slide. Just wanted to highlight here for a moment some of the data that we uh, are able to uh, have some visibility in 
uh, to with respect to uh, suicide risk. And I'm just pointing this out here for a couple of reasons. One um, is to show that uh, for chat and text, and we've talked a lot about this, um, but this just kind of graphically shows this uh, in numeric form, that <clears throat> thoughts of suicide, uh, either current or recent, are quite elevated in chat and text for people as who complete the ch chat and text surveys um, as, a, as compared to what has been shown historically in some of the evaluation work that's been done with calls. And we know that younger people tend to use chat and text. And so we are serving people through chat and text who tend to be in more recent or acute stages of distress. And so it is extremely important that we continue to lean into our capacity to support those younger people uh, who are either currently suicidal or recently suicidal um, as they're contacting the lifeline. And then the other things I'll just mention here with respect to emergency dispatch, which again are numbers that we have spoken about. Um, and this is intended to emphasize that the percentage of emergency dispatch encounters in the lifeline is quite low. So that the vast majority of situations encounters on the lifeline do not require emergency dispatch, even when people are having current thoughts of suicide or even when people are deemed to be at imminent risk there are opportunities to continue to provide stabilization, de-escalate, provide additional linkages and support without emergency dispatch. Next slide, please. I uh, wanted to just briefly highlight um, some work that we're doing with tribes, uh, recognizing again, as I mentioned earlier, that this is a population that we know to be at significantly elevated risk of suicide and where that risk is moving in the wrong direction. Uh, so we have been uh, conducting a lot of listening sessions, coordination, consultation. Uh, we did also issue a recent uh, notice of funding opportunity for tribes to support 988 implementation. And there are some common themes uh, around what we're hearing um, from tribal nations and tribal citizens around some of the challenges that they experience with respect to 988. Some of it is related to awareness. Some of it is related to infrastructure. And that could be things um, even as basic as internet access or uh, broadband cable access, uh, recognizing that in many tribal and uh, rural communities, especially where there's intersection there, that's not a guarantee. There are, there are gaps in, in access to services there. There's also a lot of challenges with respect to cultural sensitivity, cultural training, uh, awareness of cultural needs and preferences, and then how those tribal services are coordinated with other existing crisis services. Tribes are a sovereign nations. Um, not all tribes have great working relationships with states. Sometimes, sometimes there's great examples of coordination, but sometimes not. Uh, and so there are a lot of challenges here in terms of how we coordinate those services, how we include elders and respected leaders from tribal communities to be able to drive some of that coordination. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a, a kind of a, a summary example of how through SAMHSA we are exercising some of our funding opportunities specifically um, to support uh, 988 implementation through both the network administrator, through states, territories, and tribes, and ultimately supporting uh, centers to be able to provide a coordinated approach uh, to building uh, that 988 uh, crisis system capacity. You can move on to the next slide. And thank you, Richard. I see that there's active questions in the chat, which I'm happy to look at <laughs> once, once I'm done, but it seems like Richard is Richard is on it, so I appreciate that. Um, I know we've talked a lot about the Partner Toolkit, so I'm not going to spend time on this slide other than I think you all are aware of how to access this and what some of the materials are. You can move on to the next slide. Um, here's some current print materials and some things to come. I am particularly, I don't know why I'm so enthusiastic about the yard signs, but I'm really excited about the yard signs. I'm, we can replace our Dr. Fauci sign with a 988 yard sign, and I'm very excited about that. Um, and that will be coming soon. Um, and you can definitely uh, go to our website uh, for printable materials um, to learn how to order them, download them, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, a quick review of the communications research. I think we've talked a little bit about the formative research that's underway um, on specific audiences, specific populations at higher risk of suicide. You can see some of the 
kind of purpose and goals behind this, uh, very much to understand uh, attitudes, beliefs, um, help-seeking behaviors, motivating factors, influencers, trusted messengers. This work is well underway uh, in terms of the phase one piece, including a landscape review, some SME interviews, a lot of the qualitative research has been completed, um, and now moving on to the quantitative research that's beginning this month. You can see here listed the populations that we've been particularly interested uh, in understanding and working with. Um, and then uh, flagging here at the bottom of this slide, a phase two, the planning for which is underway, which will include additional audiences, additional populations, because we do see this work as critically important as we think ultimately of sort of laying breadcrumbs for that national campaign where we want to be able to lean into that promotion of help seeking behavior. Next slide, please. Um, and then flagging here uh, some efforts, obviously, that are underway and that continue to need to be developed and amplified regarding 988 and 911 coordination. Some of this is policy at the policy level. A lot of work is happening at the practice implementation level in terms of best practices. And then we at SAMHSA have been working with our partners in the Department of Justice and other departments to promote uh, awareness for first responder communities, understanding what their needs are, developing toolkits to support their incorporation of 988 into the services that they provide. Again, all with the interest of driving toward health first responses that minimize law enforcement uh, involvement in crisis encounters. Next slide, please. And then so wrapping up like with these next few slides that speak to some of the highlights and conversations that are ongoing now with respect to recent convenings. So SAMHSA, NASHVID, McKinsey Health Institute, a bunch of other planning partners have been involved in a series of convenings over the past year beyond. Uh, many of you have lent your expertise and involvement and participation in these and we're extremely appreciative um, of that. The most recent ones were held in December of 2022. There were, I think, about 600 uh, individuals and organizations that participated, um, very much focused on challenges facing the crisis care system and the broader ecosystem as we move forward. Um, and you can see here, we sort of organized some of the themes along some categories that we think are extremely important um, to elevate as we're thinking about crisis system development moving forward. So sustainable funding. What are some of those varied funding approaches that are going to support um, uh, building out crisis systems? How do we define those services that lend themselves well to billing for them? How do we leverage technology? I know people don't like the word interoperability, so I will not use it, even though I just did, but talk about data exchange. How do we, how do we have systems communicate with each other so that the care, the care continuum is a more seamless integrated service uh, for people in crisis? Lifting up the voice of equity, how do we incorporate the perspective, the input, the expertise of uh, marginalized, excluded, historically harmed community members to make them a part of the, the decision making, the system design, the evaluation um, of, of the crisis system. Looking at opportunities to elevate conversations around crisis curriculum development at the national level, around national peer support worker standards. Uh, around other opportunities that can leverage uh, expertise in the behavioral health workforce space, incentives, loan repayment, and so forth. Um, and then around communications, lots of conversations around, again, the representation of individuals with lived and living experience, making sure that they are participating in working groups, advisory commi committees, uh, incorporating community leaders to ensure that communications are, are effective and inclusive. Next slide. Uh, and just a couple of uh, drill downs here um, on the technology side here, you can see some of the, the kind of the, the more granular areas of focus around some of those technology conversations. So some of this is thinking about are there increased sort of technologies around data and analytics, artificial intelligence, ways that we can understand or real time data surveillance that can improve the responsiveness of the system uh, moving forward. Are there softwares, uh, software services, platforms um, that can help integrate that crisis continuum, again, to create that more seamless experience? 
other novel uh, digital treatment options aside from telehealth, which we, you know, which is an important one, but are there additional ones that can actually increase access to care uh, for individuals in crisis? And then what are, what are some of the basic kind of floor, what's the floor kind of requirement for digital infrastructure to serve everybody? And how do we build redundancy to mitigate against risks for outages or security concerns to make sure that we have a reliable, trusted system that's going to be there for everybody? Next slide, please. Um, and then this was uh, on the financial piece, again, a, a, uh, an analysis of some of the work that's been done around emergency department claim, claims related to behavioral health services. We know that there's a lot of emergency department activity in the behavioral health space. Um, although in terms of actual claims codes, uh, not heavily used. Um, we know that this is not an accurate reflection of the degree to which behavioral health issues are represented in emergency departments, but also good to get kind of a landscape picture um, of what's happening in emergency departments with respect to payer involvement um, regarding uh, service delivery. And thinking about if we were to move away from a system where emergency department uh, transfers are the only um, response to crisis services, how can payers be involved in this conversation to shift some of those resource allocations, resource decisions, so that services can be provided in more community-based settings more proactively? Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, um, Looking at that sustainability conversation, this is a very complicated slide, um, but looking at the various ways, various levers that we have from the all the way from the policy end at the federal level. So I talked a little bit about how we're- um, I see control, uh, there's a control at the bottom. Yes, is that what- Sorry. Um, at the policy level, um, Thinking about are there some levers that we we have uh, that we can lean into at the federal level to support on um, key performance measures for crisis care, um, establishing crisis care as a key component of some of the parity work that's being done to make that more explicitly included at the policy level. So there's pieces there. There's a lot of work potentially at the standards or regulatory level um, around provider types. Uh, around defining those services and providing standards for particular service delivery. And then as we move to the right, thinking about uh, are there archetypes for reimbursement? What are the payment models? Are there alternative payment models that are actually are in practice now that can be um, used as kind of benchmarks for how we might want to think about financing health uh, crisis services moving forward? And then how do we translate that into actual operations at the, at the clinic level? Uh, to support individuals. Next slide, please. And I think that's it. I think I went over my time, so I apologize, Brian, but I'm 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 really happy to answer questions and really excited to hear what uh, Dr. Hepburn has, has to say. Well, in actuality, John, to be honest with you, if you look at the chat box, which is hard to do while you're talking, it is filled with a ton of wonderful questions. But I think the theme that I'm getting from them is that they want more. They would love to have a more in-depth discussion of some of the factors that you talked about. I'm gonna turn it over to Brian real quickly, but I'm going to just make mention, if you will. Uh, one of the things that has resonated well with me, John, was when you mentioned about the response time, because I know when people in need, that is a critical factor. So actually to see that from two minutes, 46 down to 49 seconds is life-saving for many individuals. So thank you for, again for sharing that and with all of the information that's there. Yeah, thanks, Brian. I mean, I mean, our goal is to get to 20 seconds, so we still have a ways to go, but we are moving in the right direction. Perfect, perfect. And now I'd like to bring in Dr. Brian Hepburn, our Executive Director through NASPIT for some roundtable discussion. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so thank you, Brian, uh, and uh, Dr. Palmeri, another excellent presentation. Uh, thank you to SAMHSA for its leadership and to you specifically for all the hard work that you've put into this over uh, the last uh, year to year and a half, so thank you. Uh, also, let me say that uh, I'm very proud to be on this uh, learning community because I think RI has done a really nice job working with SAMHSA and week in and week out, uh, the RI team does a great job. So thank you for that. 
Also want to say that I'm missing Kana and Amoto. She was supposed to also participate uh, on the round table with me. So I'll try and channel her a little bit in some of my comments. Want to thank uh, uh, Miriam Delphin Rittman, the assistant secretary for her leadership at SAMHSA that has really been instrumental in helping us move forward. I would say we really have a movement at this point, a 988 crisis movement that is uh, ready to change the system. And uh, it's pretty impressive when I look at the names of all the people and the organizations that they represent that are on this call. This truly is a movement that will create major change in behavioral health. And uh, I thank you for all, all of you for the energy. So uh, I want to just focus quickly on uh, the themes that John talked about close to the end and just make some quick comments. And I know we're behind time, so I'll try and talk very quickly. Uh, the states across the country are focused on the themes that John talked about, sustainability, technology, workforce, equity, and communications. Uh, when we look at sustainability, there's a lot of money out there right now. Uh, the concern of the states is, will the money still be there in three to five years? Because we're on a project that's gonna take a number of years to accomplish. And if we run out of funding in three to five years, that would be really disappointing. So uh, states are very focused on sustainable funding. Technology, states are also uh, liking the way that SAMHSA is looking at technology from an aspirational standpoint. How do we use technology to change the trajectory and improve the overall quality of care? Uh, the, uh, uh, I guess a good example of how technology may be helpful is the Oklahoma model of the iPads, which is really changing how crisis care is being done in Oklahoma and how uh, police are being involved with behavioral health experts in Oklahoma. Uh, the, another area is workforce. As you know, everybody's working on workforce right now. Uh, we're all concerned about it, but we're looking at how can the change in the system, how, so that more people get their care in the community earlier, how will that impact overall healthcare needs? If we can keep people out of higher level services, keep them out of jail, that should really help alter the workforce needs. And let's get people uh, the care they, they need as early as possible. Uh, another area that John brought up was equity. Uh, what we want to do is make sure across the states that individuals who have traditionally been marginalized are able to share in this new system. So that what we find is that in every jurisdiction, in every group, there will be true equity and sharing in the benefits of this new system. The other area that John talked about was communication. And I would add marketing to the communication how do we move ahead with the marketing similar to what we saw earlier so that people are aware of the 988 system, but they're able to access the services that are needed in order to uh, fully implement the 988 crisis services so that we don't move uh, too quickly ahead with marketing ahead of where, in the, where the services are, that we're able to do it in a way that when people seek those services, they'll be able to access those services. So with that, I will end, but I want to thank John Palmieri and SAMHSA for all their hard work and their leadership. Uh, the potential here is great. The movement is on. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and best wishes. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, John. Uh, very, very rich discussion, and I know that going forward, we're going to benefit from this material that's presented today. So thank you again for it. Uh, let's go ahead and move on in our uh, jam here. This is a, it's again a reminder that the SAMHSA store, as John has pointed out, and we talked about a little earlier, is available to everyone. Go and get your free material. Make it a part of John. I loved your point about the yard signs. I think that would be great. I'm willing to put a ton of them in my neighborhood just to kind of raise awareness because uh, we have been asking and people still don't know what 988 is. So it's really imperative that we kind of get it out there. Uh, next slide, please. And as well, a reminder about the t-shirt acquisition. Uh, coming up next, we'll have the hot seat, but just a reminder to everyone that 
you have the ability to get these t-shirts. Karen will put the link in the box for you. You can go to it. You can purchase these long sleeve, short sleeve. You can get hats otherwise, or you can volunteer to be in the hot seat or even host the crisis jam and we'll give you a free t-shirt. Next slide, please. So now we are ready for the uh, hot seat today. And today we have on our hot seat, Shelly Curran, who is the uh, Director of Crisis Cultural Prevention and Court Programs with Mercy Care. Thank you so much for being willing to be a part of this hot seat today, Shelly. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to make this pretty quick. Uh, you, you have uh, probably seen how we operate with this. It's kind of in the uh, realm of... Uh, who wants to be a millionaire per se, but you have options here. Read the question out. You can, uh, we'll poll the audience. You can go with the audience. You can ask a friend, you can uh, do, or you can just answer it on your own. So going forward with it, uh, let's just go with it. Becker's Hospital Review publishes the hospitals with the most ER visits. So in 2019, Parkland Health and Hospital System in Dallas, Texas was the busiest emergency room in the United States where nearly 8 million live in the metro area. So your question of the following, which was the least busy hospital emergency room in that same year? So you have your choices of Atlanta's Brady Hospital, Boston's Medical Center, Fayetteville, North Carolina's Cape Fear Valley Medical, and New York City Health and Hospital in Lincoln. So how would you like to handle this question? And while we are thinking about it, just two things to add, the little clips that you see at the edges there represent the number of millions of individuals that were served in those specific hospital elements. And we'll go ahead and post the uh, poll for everyone. And we're asking that if you see it on your screen, please answer uh, and send it back in to us so that Shelly has an opportunity to see that. So Shelly, I will ask you, which way would you like to go with this? Do you want to... Uh, Take a stab on your own, or do you know the response? No, or? I want to see the poll. <laughs> okay, Please, we'll I post the poll for you uh, momentarily. As as okay. it, and there it is. And what you're seeing is that All almost right. two thirds are going with Fayetteville, North Carolina's Cape Fear Valley Medical Center, and a smaller percentage of you know Austin. <laughs> a well-informed group, and I, I trust you all, so I'm going to go C. All righty. Well, then C would be Fayetteville, North Carolina's Cape Fear Valley, and let's see the answer, please. And the answer is Boston's oh. Medical Center. I mean, you know, sometimes the numbers kind of throw us off, you know, and I think this is one of those situations because emergency medical services system work in the same rural America, but for a lot of rural Americans, they have to drive a long distance. So 15 uh, minutes to Brady includes a population of almost you know, a million individuals and 15 minutes from Cape Fear. So looking at this uh, Boston Medical Center, uh, Shelly, make sure you get your t-shirt, make sure you connect with others. And I do want to so thank you for being a part of the crisis hot seat for today. Absolutely, thank you. All righty. And let's move on to the next slide, please. I'm gonna ask at this time for uh, Dr. Richard McKeon, if you will come in and make a few comments, please, on behalf of SAMHSA. Here we go. Okay, I'm back. All righty. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> All right, so um, I will, I'll mention a couple of things. I was busy trying to keep up with the questions on the chat that were coming in. I don't think I got to all of them, but let me mention a couple of things. So one, there were, there were a number of chats regarding the question of discrepancies around answer rates um, between local centers and the numbers from Vibrant. So the best way to follow um, up um, on that, and I put in the chat, would be to contact James Wright at James dot right at samsa.hhs.gov. James has devoted many hours to studying exactly this issue, and he is by far the best expert um, on that. Uh, so that would be my suggestion. You know, there were also lots of, um, you know, questions, understandably, about the uh, uh, imminent risk uh, callers, chatters, texters, 
um, and particularly regarding uh, the use of emergency interventions, uh, which as a percentage of the whole is quite small. Uh, um, and uh, the one of the questions was around emergency interventions. Do we uh, track on whether it was voluntary or involuntary? And we do track on that. And they are roughly equal. The other thing to be aware of is that the majority of the emergency interventions are for suicide attempts in progress. But that being said, there is a strong need, and we currently are working on how to strengthen our data sources to be able to give us as much information as possible about these very high-risk situations. And in particular, what happens after the call or, or the chat or the text um, as an, an important piece uh, to that, because we very much want to know everything that we can about what is happening in these situations. Madeline Gould's um, evaluation study that's been published and we can recirculate did show that in a very substantial number of cases where a caller was at imminent risk, the call takers were able to decrease the risks enough so that um, emergency intervention was not required. I would also say that I think an, an important area to pay attention to where um, additional work needs to be done really has to do with, as, as you know, SAMHSA has been working to do everything we can, collaborating with CMS to expand the access to mobile crisis teams that are able to respond without the police. Um, and that is a continuing uh, effort that SAMHSA is engaging in. Um, but co-responder models do exist for sure. You know, there are times like a suicide attempt in progress when the, the, it is critical to save a life to send an emergency intervention. But there are also localities where um, only co-responder models are utilized. And usually the reason that's given for that, and I've made inquiries in a couple of, of areas uh, about why are mobile crisis teams without the police not being utilized. And the answer that's typically given is safety of the responder, where, and often in the background, there has been um, a death or serious injury to a responder that has led to the system being shaped that way. But what I think it means is that we have significant work we still need to do about how we can best minimize the use of police, but when police do need to be util utilized to specify the circumstances and to make sure that those police who respond are as well-trained as possible. So I think that these are really important questions that are being answered and ones that SAMHSA is dedicated to continue working on. So thanks. And, and thank you, Dr. McCann. And thanks for all the efforts that come out of SAMHSA. That's phenomenal. Uh, I'm gonna move very quickly to uh, the NASHBID report. And today we have Amy Brinkley, who's the Recovery uh, Support Systems Coordinator for NASHBID. And Amy, if you will speak for a moment or two just on what's happening in your end of the world. Happy to. Thank you, Dr. Sims. Good afternoon, everybody. We do have a little bit of a storm, so I'm glad I've only got a couple minutes here. I'm worried about my internet lasting. So it's great to be back on Crisis Jam with you guys. Dr. Hepburn had asked me to do the NASHBIT update today, so I just wanted to share with you guys a snippet of what we're working on in this year's round of papers. So as you all know, we do a round of papers each year that get published, and this year my colleague Justin Volpe and I are collaborating on one particular paper titled Peer Support Services Across the Crisis Continuum. And as you can imagine, there's a great number of resources out on crisis services, but significantly fewer resources on the integration of peer support within crisis services. So with the workforce crisis, there seems to be a significant push, it seems, to use the paraprofessionals and the peers to fill that gap um, in a way that allows the licensed clinicians to work at the top of their skill set. 
that in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. However, having recovery oriented and friendly workplaces for peers to work in, especially within higher stress um, environments like crisis services is crucial. So within this paper, we'll share some highlights from SAMHSA's recently released peer support services and crisis care advisory document, which has been very helpful and informative. Um, in addition to that report, we'll talk about the National Academy for State Health Policy, which outlines the various ways that states are already implementing peer support services within the crisis continuum. Um, as states build out the infrastructure for someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go or be, it's crucial for states to consider how people with lived experience can help build that crisis infrastructure in all of the spaces, which we all already know on this call. Um, being a peer myself and having lost three brothers to suicide, I speak from that lived and living experience when I say that these things do matter. One thing I did want to note is that NRI, the Nashville Research Institute, released their state profile reports recently. And in those reports, there's a peer workforce specific report, which highlights the fact that 33 states are in the process of recruiting peers currently. And 45% of the responding states said that reimbursement rates for peers are too low, which has been a longstanding contention uh, to the expansion of peer support. So I just wanted to put a little plug in that and note that that still has not been um, solved for most states yet. In addition to that, 22 states have uh, reportedly have crisis peer trainings underway in various stages of implementation and development. So if anybody's interested in learning more about what's happening in your, your state, we would encourage you to investigate. Um, all of this and more will be highlighted in the paper. So if you have an area of focus you want to highlight or intentionally share or focus on within the paper, feel free to let us know and feel free to share any resources. I just added some resources to my list following uh, this call. So it's been great being here with you all and I hope you have a great week. Alrighty, thank you. And thank you, Amy, for all of the wonderful work you're doing with NASPA. I want to move down to our uh, the uh, uh, crisis talk today with Stephanie Hepburn. Um, and Stephanie, I'm going to let you take it. Uh, <laughs> apologize for the time here. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Sims. So I'm going to introduce Victor Armstrong. Uh, many of you on this call know him. He's the Chief Diversity Officer at RI International, and he's also the former Mental Health Commissioner of North Carolina. Vic, can you share, there's a chasm in the momentum of 988. Can you share what that means? Yeah, um, and thank you for, for doing this article, Stephanie. But, but by chasm, what I'm really speaking to is there, there is a gap both in perception and functionality of 988, 988 particularly as it pertains to Black and Brown communities. I think there's still a, a lack of understanding of um, what 988 is, why 988 is different, and different, especially in terms of why should 988 be trusted any more than uh, the system that that has operated in the past. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to really bridge that gap of understanding. And you mean nine one one specifically in policing? Yeah, yeah I think I think in, in still in the, in the in the black and brown community, there's a perception that nine eight eight is just the next iteration of nine one one, and there still exists a chasm of understanding both in within the black and brown community of what we're trying to accomplish with nine eight eight. But I think there's also a lack of understanding on on the part of us as policymakers as to really mm -hmm. what the what that trepidation is in black and brown communities around uh 911 and 988 i think we don't fully appreciate sometimes that oftentimes the problems in black and brown communities regarding uh law enforcement are not about police in particular it's about policing as an institution right. and it is also about the fact that there's not a disdain for law enforcement for black men in particular, there's a fear of law enforcement. And I think when we understand that, I think we have a, a different type of conversation. And a justifiable fear. I mean, I think that's part of the distinction yeah. too. And that's why different lenses and different perspectives are, are so very important and why you launched your podcast, which is to have these tough conversations, to have Absolutely. this strong talk. Can you talk a little bit about you talked about both talking to people within the Black community and, like you said, policymakers. Can you dive yeah. a little bit into what that means? Yeah, there are conversations that need to be had both between um, communities and within communities. And mm -hmm. when I talk about communities, I mean communities, um, however people identify their own community, the Black community, the faith-based community, the law enforcement community, the mental health community as a, in a broader sense. 
there are conversations that need to be had regarding um, how we have, have really transpired to this place where we are now in terms of perceptions of mental health, in terms of stigma uh, regarding mental health, and how we um, all access services. But there are also conversations to be had within those communities. We in the mental health community really need to understand the, some of the, the, the responsibility that we have mm -hmm. uh, as policymakers, as administrators of these services, as the trusted uh, administrators of these services, uh, the responsibility we have for having missed many of the populations that needed us the most. And then within a lot of these communities, I use the black community as an example, growing up in the black community, um, I never uh, really understood that suicide, for example, does impact the black community. I was taught something different. I was taught also to, to mask and stuff mental health feelings and not talk, or uh, uh, mental health challenges and not talk about them. So there are conversations that I want us to have within communities about how we need to uh, be willing to open up and talk about our challenges. But there are also conversations that need to be had um, in other communities about how to reach into those communities. And I'm, what I'm hoping is that as we have these conversations, we create uh, more opportunities for us to bring all of the parties to the table mm -hmm. um, and so that we can have these conversations and increase understanding. You can't improve upon and fix what you do not understand. You can try. You can be well-intentioned, but you will not be successful. Thank you so much for joining the call. Thank I'll you. send it back to you, Dr. Sims. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steph. Thank you, Vic. Wonderfully presented. Uh, we're going to, we're pressed for time. We're going to move to the next slide, please. We're actually coming right back to Victor uh, for the, and Vic, you get the final words here, my friend, uh, in terms of strong talk. Go right ahead, sir. We are, in many ways, the sirens of crisis services. We cry loud and spare not as we educate legislators, providers, and communities about our mission to create a more effective, a more robust crisis system. We passionately pound the table with righteous anger in order to capture the attention of any who do not recognize the fierce urgency of now as it pertains to America's mental health crisis. As we heard earlier, in and John Palmari shared, recently, the CDC released data showing deaths in the United States increased in the years 2020 and 2021, after a slight decline in 2018 to 2019. The report also highlighted troubling trends showing disproportionate increases amongst Native American, Black, and Hispanic groups, especially among youth, even during a period of decline for white Americans. Suicide does not discriminate. Neither, however, should our interventions. Equitable care must remain a key priority as our emergency mental health response continuum continues to evolve because despite our most noble efforts or our most eloquent rhetoric, true parity cannot exist unless it exists for all. True parity cannot exist without equity. Recent history has taught us that having open supportive dialogue that builds trusted relationships finds trusted messengers and yields a trusted message can lead to potentially life-saving action and intervention. We've also learned that having a robust crisis response system that is informed by individuals with lived experience and is accessible to historically marginalized communities is protective against suicide risk for the entire population. And we've learned that screening for suicide risk and providing evidence-informed, culturally sensitive, risk-reducing clinical care, including education and support for patients and families where they live, work, play, and pray saves lives. President John F. Kennedy famously stated that a rising tide lifts all boats, but that only occurs when the tide covers the entire terrain. And raising the water level of the lower basins does not mean de denying water to the higher basins, but it does require removing the levees of structural exclusion. We have not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to move forward toward a more inclusive system, one that considers the nuances of race, ethnicity, culture, sexual orientation, and gender identity, physical disability, and rurality. If we do not, if we in fact move forward without giving our full effort to support those who have been historically marginalized, disenfranchised, the message those communities will hear is, 
You were never our target audience to begin with. And that is strong talk. Victor, you know, it's always been said that what people take away is the last thing that they hear. <laughs> Let this be the most wonderful thing that everyone has heard. I am so impressed with it. Thank you so much, Victor, Thank you. for sharing that, but also linking up that whole discussion about parity and, and equity. I mean, it is such an important linkage to be able to understand if we're going to be moving forward. So uh, just thank you. Thank you again. And I want to thank, thank everyone you. for being a part of the call today. Just to let you know, we will have some upcoming uh, crisis jams. Uh, we'll have uh, Eric Senor Rojas, uh, who will be speaking on March 1st on culture response of mental health crisis services. We invite you all to come out for that. We will have also um, other ones coming up, uh, one in April from Cosette Yelly on Rahum in community mobile crisis response. So looking forward to seeing all of you in future jams. And I thank you again so much for being a part of this crisis jam. Everyone have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you next week.